Carla Mulford. I'm a professor of English. I've called my talk Benjamin Franklin, Science and Civic Life. Um, because I'm researching Franklin, I've been researching Franklin for too long, over 20 years actually. I um, actually completed one book, and this book was published in 2015. I was interested in Franklin's um, interactions, his ideas about uh, empire, and the extent to which the British Empire was not being supportive of the individual laborer um, in North America. And so uh, this is a book where I explore that idea. But there was an idea related to science that I couldn't really talk about, and uh, I've decided to do another book. I call this Benjamin Franklin's Electrical Diplomacy, and it's essentially going to be based around the fact that Franklin um, made a very important discovery of the positive and negative charges of electricity. So the book I'm currently working on um, is showing how Franklin used his scientific findings and his reputation to leverage his imperial negotiations. It sounds like a commonplace, but few historians provide concrete evidence regarding the intersections of Franklin's scientific and political careers. I'm tracing how Franklin circulated his manuscripts and printed scientific papers to the general public and to politicians um, at crucial moments in his political negotiations. Franklin attempted to influence political decision making by reminding people regularly about his scientific fame. His scientific and political careers go hand in hand. And so this is Franklin's famous book. It was published in 1751. He received an honor from the Royal Society when this book was published. His determination regarding the positive and negative charges of electricity absolutely electrified the scientific community. He was hailed as a genius in England, France, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Russia. His writings on electricity were translated immediately. His image was sought after by thousands, and this is thousands uh, across Europe. Um, it, and so uh, I decided to show you some portraits, some famous portraits of Franklin. This is called uh, the thumb portrait because of the way that Franklin is seated. And this is by David Martin. It was uh, painted in 1767. It shows Franklin reading state papers at his desk. He's wearing clothes appropriate for a statesman, and he's seated before a bust of Newton. The bust underscores the importance of Franklin's scientific findings and associates him scientifically with Newton, while at the same time his dress and activity identify his importance in affairs of state. This is Mason Chamberlain's 1762 portrait of Franklin. Franklin commissioned this portrait. He wanted people to see an illustration of his work in electricity, he, where he was at, at the moment at which he was discovering the positive and negative electrical charges that form electricity. There's a storm outside his window. That storm is striking uh, lightning rods, and those lightning rods are connected by wires to the bells that were on the second floor in Franklin's home. And so he wanted this moment memorialized. Um, it wasn't just that he wanted it painted. Once it, the painting was completed, he asked for an etching to be made of it, and he put this on small cards. He made calling cards that he would actually take with him when he went to call on people. So when he went to call on friends, but especially statesmen, instead of you know, giving a little card with his name on it, he would give this card instead with a little message on the back. And so um, he understood that this was a way to remind people on a regular basis um, of his scientific accomplishments. Franklin was an Enlightenment philosopher. Like many in his generation, he believed that the natural world could be harnessed to improve people's lives. He was attentive to the smallest elements in the natural world, and he encouraged young people to learn as much as possible about the world they lived in. I'm going to provide you an excerpt of a letter he wrote to, I'm sorry, to his young friend, um, Polly Stevenson. Your observations on what you, and she was seven when she was writing, exchanging these letters with him. She was seven years old. Your and this is Franklin's uh, reply to her. Your observations on what you've lately read concerning insects is very just and solid. 
Superficial minds are apt to despise those who make that part of creation their study as mere triflers. But certainly the world has been much obliged to them. Under the care and management of man, the labors of the little silkworm afford employment and subsistence to thousands of families and become an immense article of commerce. The bee, too, yields us its del delicious honey and its wax, useful to a multitude of purposes. Another insect, it says, produces the cochineal, from whence we have our rich scarlet dye. The usefulness of the canther cantharides or Spanish flies in medicine is known to all, and thousands owe their lives to that knowledge. By human industry and observation, other properties of other insects may possibly be hereafter discovered and of equal utility. A thorough acquaintance with the nature of these little creatures may also enable mankind to prevent the increase of such as are noxious or secure us against the mischiefs they occasion. Animals and even insects could help humans, Franklin thought. Today, of course, Earth Day, we're attentive to the extent to which humans need to help the Earth and its animals in the face of the depletion of natural resources. Franklin's scientific contributions fall into many areas of civic life, including, and I could have done a dozen of these, but I chose three, including medicine, the arts, and international trade. In medicine, Franklin developed the flexible catheter. Franklin refined the ancient design of catheters, which were stiff and straight devices, by creating a flexible catheter for his favorite brother, John. John had kidney stones, and Franklin worked with a local silversmith to make a thin, flexible de device to ease John's difficulties. In music, Franklin created the glass harmonica. He refined the idea of playing music by using liquid inside glass. And um, there are some young people here. Perhaps you've tried the experiment where you put different levels of water inside a glass, and then you wet your finger, and you can actually make a sound by rubbing the top of the glass. This is what people did in the 16th and 17th centuries, even into the 18th centuries. 18th century. Because Franklin understood the notion of friction on glass, he did away with the liquid and was able to make a machine that went sideways and uh, attached to foot pedals so that uh, music could be um, uh, articulated. He refined the idea of playing music by using liquid inside glass and created this glass harmonica, which was enjoyed throughout Britain and Europe. Mozart and Beethoven both wrote music for the harmonica in Franklin's day. In international trade, or what I call commerce, um, he, made a, he, he charted the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is a warm uh, section of water in the Atlantic Ocean. And he, he began to understand that the differentials in the temperature of the ocean might assist mariners as they went across the Atlantic. And so to assist shipping traffic between England and Britain, Franklin worked with his cousin and friend Timothy Folger to design a map of the Gulf Stream that Franklin had already charted so the mariners would find the best course to use in crossing the Atlantic Ocean. And there's a copy of his map. I, I, you probably can't see it, but he has little ships um, uh, circulating there on the Gulf Stream itself. It's really um, quite an ingenious map uh, given the um, you know, relative difficulty of creating maps um, to show a broad swath in his era. Do you Sudoku? How many of you Sudoku? How many of you do that? Oh, okay. You're going to like this, unless you already knew it. Here's Franklin's 4 by 4 magic square. The sums on this one equal 34. If you go across the rows or down the columns, in every case, you're going to have 34. Looks easy. Because it looks too easy, try this one. This is Franklin's eight, and this is Franklin's handwriting. This is Franklin's eight by eight magic square. In this case, the sum is 260. 
Each row and column of the square have this common sum of 260, but note also that half of each row or column is half of 260. He added the complication of what he called bent rows, and these equal the sum of 260. So those little triangular um, marks he made uh, tells us uh, which ones to use in order to find 260. If that still seems too easy to you, look at his magic circle. Now this is in a, a big format um, at the American Philosophical Society. Each ring, including the center entry, sums to 360. Franklin also highlighted 20 eccentric rings. It's hard to make out. I'm sorry about the quality of the image. And each of these, when taken with the central number 12, sums to 360. Franklin had other designs as well. These are available, I discovered, uh, just the other day on the internet. So if you want to um, examine this for yourself, um, just use a search term Franklin and Magic Squares or Franklin and Magic Circle. Um, I think especially it's just, it's just very delightful to see the uh, different combinations that he created. And so I'll just say feel free to drop me a line if you have any questions about my work or about Benjamin Franklin. Thank you.